Well, now joining us on Book TV is Jenny Nordberg. Ms. Nordberg, what do you do for a living? I am a foreign correspondent based in New York. I write for a Swedish paper called Svenska Dagbladet. It's a national Swedish paper. And I'm also an investigative reporter who has worked a lot for American media. How long have you been a journalist? I have been here since 2002 when I came to Columbia to go to graduate school. And you're a Pulitzer Prize winner. I was part of a project that won a Pulitzer Prize, to be exact. And what was that project? It was an investigation into the American freight railroad, railroad system for the New York Times. The Swedish paper that you work for, is it comparable to the New York Times? Is it that size? We'd like to think so, certainly. I'd say it's the Wall Street Journal, maybe. The conservative version of a, of a national newspaper in Sweden, if there's such a thing in Sweden. How often have you been to Afghanistan? Um, I came there for the first time in 2009. Uh, that was my first trip, so I came late for this war. Uh, and since then, I've been back almost every year, living there for about three months at a time. My last trip was last summer in 2013. What is it about Afghanistan that attracted you? Well, I, f I think I first came there um, with the idea that I wanted to understand the war um, the way I saw it. The, sort of the second big war of my generation uh, and also a big crime that was going on against my kind with women. I wanted to understand what was happening there and why there was this story of, of you know, fundamentalists and suppression and, and especially against women. So that's what I set out to do. And what was that crime? Well, in Afghanistan, it's, it's considered to be the worst place on earth to be a woman, according to the UN. It's also the most dangerous place to be a woman. And, 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 and why is that? You know, why, can't, why have women no rights almost? Why do all the rights belong to men? Why can't women leave the house or work or drive cars? Or, or, you know, and, and why is there such abuse against women? There's a, an enormous uh, prevalence of domestic abuse and women burn themselves to death and, and things like that. So I wanted to just figure out what was going on, you know, in our time, right under our noses and against before, women. Before we get into the book that came from your experience in Afghanistan, what was your personal experience as a woman in Afghanistan? You mean working there as a yes. reporter? Mm -hmm. Well, it's an absolute advantage to be a woman, uh, to be a female reporter in a very conservative country because you get access to both parts of the population. You have access to men as a foreigner and almost being a neuter, and you have access to the women, whereas a male reporter would have difficulty you know, speaking to women, for instance, because they're so secluded and so protected. Uh, so as a woman, you can, you can go between uh, the two genders, and that gives you an enormous advantage, actually. And you're seen almost as a as a, as a third gender, as, as, as a foreign entity, and for that reason they also allow you to, to come into their lives. Well, Jenny Nordberg, you're, out of your experience in Afghanistan came this book, The Underground Girls of Kabul. Who are these girls? The Underground Girls of Kabul, as, as I think of them, uh, they, uh, they're part of a secret practice that goes on in Afghanistan right under uh, right under the surface where little girls are actually being brought up as boys. Since girls have so little value there, it's a very strict patriarchy, um, gender segregation where men have almost all the rights. Uh, being born a girl is often seen as a disappointment to the family. Uh, they prefer sons because sons are who will inherit, they will carry on the family name. It's almost like if you think of you know, our own history, far back, our own foremothers and forefathers, sons were very, very important for a family. And then if you don't have any sons in a family, um, the family is considered weak, it's vulnerable. And for families then who don't have, um, who don't have any sons, they will many times take a girl and they will cut off her hair and put her in pants and let her out into the world more than, uh, more than a world would normally be allowed to do. What's the term that's used for that? It's called bacha push, and it literally means dressed up as a boy in Dari, which is the, one of the official languages in Afghanistan. I found this out because an Afghan, I spoke to an Afghan about this, and she said, oh, it's the bacha push. So it turned out that there was actually a term 
for those who officially don't exist. And that's when I realized also that there must be many more of these girls. And that's how you discovered this practice? I discovered this practice originally by um, interviewing a female parliamentarian on the topic of women and what it was like there. Um, and I came into, she invited me into her family and into her house. And when she was in another room, I spoke to, she has four children, and I spoke to her twin daughters. Um, and the family had been presented to me as having three daughters and a young boy. And the two oldest girls said to me, you know, our brother is really a girl. And then I thought that I was like, okay, you know, they, they speak a little bit of English and I thought maybe we had a language issue. Um, and then, but I of course thought to myself that, you know, what are they talking about? And then I, I, I met the son of the family, uh, a six year old child who came in uh, with a whole different body language and attitude, short spiky hair, shooting a toy gun at me um, and, you know, presenting, himself at that time as a boy and I was too afraid to ask the mother about this I didn't really know what to do I thought you know and, and this was completely a boy to me um, so I didn't say anything for quite a while uh, I, I did the whole interview uh, we spoke for a long time and finally uh, she said I have uh, you know I have four four daughters and I knew, I think then, that she was ready to tell me the story of her family, which is that she had dressed her youngest daughter as a, as a son. How prevalent is this practice? No one knows. Uh, there, um, there's no statistics agency of a reliable kind in Afghanistan. There's very little in terms of preserved uh, libraries and research. You know, most of what's done like that now are done by, by Westerners, and, and none of the Westerners there knew anything about this practice. I tried to, I tried to ask them, you know, there are million dollar projects uh, going on in Afghanistan for a decade now to figure out the country and, and Afghans and their culture. And, um, but they didn't, they couldn't really help me when I began to ask around about this. About this. So I, uh, um, so I had to find them myself. I had to become the expert on this. And to answer your question, uh, what we like to say as journalists, or what, you know, what I've concluded is that it's not uncommon, according to Afghans that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to many, um, it cuts right across, right across social class, education, um, you know, geography. Every family who, that lacks a son will consider doing this. Some will do it, some won't. There's usually one bacha push um, in a school, um, you know, um, the teachers will know about it, uh, doctors will often know about it, neighbors will, will have an idea. Um, the way I describe it is almost as the, the, um, the American expression, don't ask, don't tell. Like every Afghan will know someone. They will know um, of a friend or a colleague or someone they went to school with. Everyone will be familiar with this, but it's a culture also and a society of minding your own business and, you know, staying out of, um, you know, others' affairs. So, so they're, they're there, they're right in front of our eyes. But to most people, they'll just be, you know, like boys on the street. Is it almost in a sense like a, the last generation having a, a son or daughter who's gay here in the States? It's exactly like that. That's a very good analogy. And that also, if you, you know, if you take that even further, and think about what it means, you know, when one gender is so suppressed and so despised and so unwanted, um, as has happened, you know, throughout our own history with, uh, with the sexuality, religion, ethnicity, race, all those things, when you, you know, when you, when you cut out one uh, and say, you know, that that's worth less than the other, there will always be people who try and, you know, just pretend to be something they're not or someone they're not out of necessity and sometimes out of you know a little bit of a revolt uh, to resist to say that you know I need to be a part of society even though I, I'm not of the preferred kind. Jenny Nordberg these young girls do they have any say in whether they're being raised as men or as boys or girls? Uh, according to my research no not really because these are children so you know, how many times can you really speak about free will and choice when it comes to very small children? I mean, 